I decided to refocus, get back into corporate life. And I worked uh, for a few years in the luxury hospitality industry. I knew how to work with people. I was in sales. So I was like, that's a great transition. Didn't really like luxury hospitality all that much. I don't know if you've seen all those fancy hotels. They look beautiful on the inside. But you know, in the back end, the back of the house, we're all like screaming around, running, with you know, our heads cut off. So I'm like, all right, don't want to do that. What am I going to do? Lots of skill sets. Uh, knew nothing about tech back then but I can learn, right? I had people skills, I had sales skills, I had business skills. What can I learn? I can learn tech. So I moved out to San Francisco, learned how to code, you know, basic web skills, and joined the startup industry and actually launched my own startup. We did a wellness uh, web app and we sold it into several of the small, medium, uh, medium-sized businesses in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I learned how to be a developer and also manage developers, engineering teams, software teams. And at the same time, I was selling it in. But you know, that amazing J-curve success story that you hear of a lot of um, startups didn't happen to me. I was a horrible failure. The company was a failure in many sense. A lot of our investors were like, eh, you're not really doing that, Greg. You're like a mom and pop shop. Maybe you should do something else. I didn't want to do anything else. So I went to an open source conference and I was pitching my product and I bumped into a whole bunch of folks at Mozilla and they said, you know, you're selling what you're selling. We don't want that. But what you can do, you can organize things, you can program. We want that. Why don't you come join our team? So that's how I got started at Mozilla. So, I mean, you know, when people say what is the clearest path to working in technology, what is the clearest path of becoming a, you know, a developer advocate, an evangelist, or working with developers, uh, look at my story. There is absolutely no clear path on getting there. So what's my story today? Uh, we're here to talk about events, producing events, um, creating communities and organizations and conferences. And I'm specifically here to talk to you more about events for developers. And of course, the first question is why? Like, why should we do this? What is the vision behind this? So we pull a lot of data, right? You can't just go up to management. And again, I work for a corporation, Mozilla Corporation. And uh, you can't go up to the CEO, CFO, CMO, all the directors in between and say, developers are awesome. Um, you, know, you know that they build our product, so let's make sure we engage them and we work with them and they know how to use our product. We back it up with data. And this is um, from the Harris poll that says, how much impact can developers have to help your company with each of the following challenges? Apparently, they make a significant impact. And how is the number of developers or software engineers changed in the following years? And this is recent data that's been pulled. And you can see that you know, there's been a significant increase in how developers are perceived. Now, another number that is significant is that they, the Harris Poll says there's, a, there's something called the developer coefficient. And they actually contribute to $3 trillion in the GDP, in global GDP. And that's, that comes down to, if you think about you know, the estimate of developers that are actually working full time in this world, um, is about 18 million developers worldwide. That comes out to be about $51,000 per developer. That is the value that you can go back to your team and say, yep, developers are important. Here's the numbers to prove it. It's a significant market. And the great part is, again, the Harris Poll shows that uh, my company, along with other major browser vendors, are doing really well in this industry. We're perceived as one of the leaders in DevRel programs, developer relations programs. So that's awesome, right? Well, maybe, maybe not, because then I inherit something that has a great reputation, some great branding, and now I'm supposed to do a lot of programming to engage and bring experience to the developer community that makes us look even better, which is always hard. So again, we look at data. And we say, well, what do developers want then, right? I need to program. I need to bring some great experiences and engagement tactics. What do I do? All right, well, top right corner says documentation. They want to know. They want tools in their toolbox. They want to be able to do their jobs really well, right? They want tutorials. They want to know uh, videos. They want to have speakers. They want access to experts. They want their engineering teams to tell them exactly how to build better websites. How do I fix my bugs is what they want. And then if you look in the bottom area where they, they say they don't care, conferences and trade shows. 
they actually think events, meh, doesn't really matter. Well, guess what? That's not true at all. And this is why we triage data, right? So we're looking at this, but we're looking at all the external inbound communication that Mozilla receives through our system that we use, Bugzilla. These are sponsorship requests. Uh, we look at on-site experiences, events that I attend and all of my colleagues attend, and they said, absolutely, if you are not at events, if you do not sponsor events, um, developers will forget who you are and they actually won't see you as relevant. So what developers may say they want and what reality you know, actually shows you might be at conflict. So then you're like, all right, we know. We have data, we have triaged information, we know events are important. Which events should we invest in? Because as we know, if we have a strategic engagement plan, you know, we can't just say, let's just invest in anything that works. Or maybe we just you know, spitball it and see which events work. Right? Where should I invest my developer marketing dollars? And it is marketing. I know, especially in our industry, we hate using that word marketing. We don't want to sell, we don't want to market, but it's true. Right? Where can we get the most impact? And of course, as the terminologies in most corporations say, what is the ROI? Right? Well, here's an example at my company at Mozilla. We actually have a three-pronged approach to our tactical reach on developer engagement and outreach. We do deliver best-in-class documentation resource. It's called the MDN Web Docs, and we actually created um, a group called the MDN Product Advisory Group that's made up of Mozillians, Googlers, Samsung folks, um, and Microsoft to bring best-in-class documentation that actually helps supports developers do their jobs better, code better, debug better, make everything that they build work on the web, which is part of our mission, right? But again, thinking about that data, that's really not enough. Yes, that's absolutely priority and what developers want, but that's not enough. What else can we do? We have a program that we just launched recently, only about two years old, called the Moz Tech Speakers Program. This is helping community members out there. And going back to all of our earlier talks that emphasized the importance of robust communities, people who are out there who are talking about technology that actually aligns with our mission, our products, we're helping them becoming professional speakers, go out to conferences because not we're a small company. Mozilla only has about 1,000 people on staff. Um, but we have 10,000 plus contributors. And out of those 10,000 contributors, we have about 200 um, technical speakers who can talk about our product. And that's what I mean by technical speakers, people who can speak about our web products. And they want to be out there. So we support them with their travel, with their training. We have uh, meetups. We have hangouts. And then every once in a while, I'll get to see them in person at our Mozilla All Hands as well. So we have about 200 people who actually actively serve as our developer advocates through the Tech Speakers program. It's been highly successful, and it's been, um, in a way, a gem in our, in our uh, suite of products because other companies also want to know, how do we get volunteers? How do we get community become true leaders and represent our company, our product, our mission um, to the community? And then the third part of our three-pronged approach is absolutely sponsorship. We have set amount of dollars, and we want to be out there with our brand presence, but we want to be at those right events, right? <clears throat> so when we say we want to be at the right events, what do we talk about? Well, we're Mozilla. We're a browser vendor. The web remains the main focus. JavaScript is the web programming language that we think about. So again, this is a very tactical, strategic approach to how do we support events that are out there. Because again, as the earlier talk said, there's so much competition. There's so many events, and there's more cropping up every day. Right? So we go back to the data, and we say there are 3 million new developers working in the JavaScript community. So yes, that makes sense, web community, JavaScript community. But we don't want to just be where technology is today. We want to look towards the future. We want to see growth. So we do have exploration, and that is where emerging technology groups comes into play as well. We look at speech. We look at something called WASM, WebAssembly. We look at games. Games on the web is growing. And we do even look at things like blockchain. And I'll share some um, percentages. You know, again, we match what we see as our data and when we triage on site. 
as where do we put our money? We put our money mostly on our JavaScript events, some games, a lot on CSS, because CSS is absolutely growing in popularity right now, um, and some others, including diversity in tech, because that is becoming a major focus. It's actually become a, um, an actual goal in part of our what we call our OKRs, Objectives and Key Results, at Mozilla to make sure that we support uh, conferences that promote diversity in tech. So let me share with you some examples about creating experiences at Mozilla. So we talked a lot about VR and how VR might dominate and replace events. Well, we love VR. We create web VR experiences. We just launched a new VR browser called Firefox Reality, September 18th. And we held um, an event at XOXO called XOXR Meetup. And we have a studio project called the XR Studio. It's an experiment pop-up project in our San Francisco office. San Francisco is good, bad, ugly in many ways, um, but it does attract talent. And we had some of the most uh, diverse group of women working on XR projects down in San Francisco. It's no good keeping people down in San Francisco, right? So we brought them up to uh, Portland and said, great, 300 people came through our Mozilla Portland office and experienced all of their projects. And it was one of the most successful meetups that we put together. VR, XR, AR experiences, bringing people together. The best of both worlds. We also tried something really new this year, working with artists. And here's an example of the arch. Um, there's an artist based in Pittsburgh, Ian Brill, and he creates these light experiences. Well, one of our engineers, Lynn Clark, actually thought, WebAssembly and Rust, two programming languages and something that compiles that programming language to have extreme performance on the web is really boring to explain. Unless, you know, you know what it is all about. But for normal people, it's kind of boring. What if we pair that up with an artistic sensory experience? So we worked with this artist, he's a light artist, and created this incredible structure where people can see visualize and feel and experience their code now as art. Uh, we launched this at JSConf Berlin, that's a JavaScript conference in Berlin, uh, and it was a huge hit. People really liked seeing their code in light art. We'll be um, reproducing this experience at GitHub Universe in San Francisco in October again. And then, you know, we talk about large events, large scale events, tent pole events that bring hundreds, thousands of people together. But again, going back to community, well, what does that mean, right? There's actual value in having small groups come together and give us feedback about what's going on in, you know, in their communities. So last year, we launched 70 roadshows to go around all over the globe to talk about Firefox. We launched a new product, so it made a lot of sense. That was a lot of good buy-in. And we were able to get a lot of feedback from community to understand what technologies are you working on today. One learning is we went to Vietnam and learned that there's actually a really robust VR AR group working on medical technologies, students working on this technology. And they want it on the web for accessibility and also uh, for cost reasons. Who knew? And talking about games, uh, we had a booth at GDC, but this was back in 20, 2016, I believe, uh, when we actually talked about Firefox and Mozilla technologies, because we were very motivated by a lot of these numbers that showed um, you know, what's going on with web game developers in this web sphere. Now, that number 43% in Q2 of 2018 looks amazing. But again, data is awesome make sure you check it twice. Because when we dug in deeper about where this number came from, it really came down to Facebook web developers for mobile games. We don't really care about that. Facebook, you know, Facebook, give it or take it, but it's not really about advancing web causes. So although these numbers looked great and we wanted to do a lot more with games and developers on the web, we decided for 2018 and 2019, we would not do investments like GDC. And here's an example of a Mozilla-owned event. Um, back four years ago, our CEO said, you know, we're a major browser vendor company. We want to tell the community what's going on on the web. Let's put a stake in the ground. And so we created ViewSource. The unique um, 
part of ViewSource conference was that unlike a Google conference or a Microsoft conference or even an Apple conference, we didn't make it about Mozilla. So as you can tell from the branding, it says presented by Mozilla, but we invited all the browser vendors and anyone else who wanted to talk about web technologies, um, especially open source web technologies, to come and speak. Now, one part of the talk here is, well, how do you know that ViewSource was a success? And I think there's a few things to talk about that. One is, well, we were able to do it again, right? People wanted to come to this conference. Um, you know, we like to say, well, ticket sales, butts and seats, that may not be the best way to gauge um, success, but Actually, it is. It is one of the metrics. It's one of those basic metrics you got to hit. If you tell management, if you tell your CEO that you're going to sell 400 tickets, you should probably sell those 400 tickets. Another measure that we um, showed was that speakers. We have an incredible lineup of speakers at ViewSource Conference. Something like this, like you know a conference is a success when speakers want to be at your conference. They want to show up. Uh, they don't say, well, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. They actually say, hey, will you be producing View Stores 2019? Uh, will you be producing and can I speak at the conference? Attendees come to you and say, hey, I had such an incredible experience. I'm going to mark it on my calendar. Right? So that, that to us is um, measures of success. And then finally, it's about the money. Like you got to either break even or be profitable. Um, if you're relying on marketing dollars as a cost spend or you're relying on sponsors, to us, that's not a sustainable model. So we don't see that as a success. Uh, success is, are you actually able to reproduce, recreate the event with either the same amount of dollars or even less, and create an incredible experience for everybody, your speakers and your attendees? So that's a lot of the work that I do at Mozilla. And I wanted to add a few more slides about what else do I do in terms of creating conferences and being an organizer for events. I think earlier on, I was almost jealous because a lot of the um, organizers were talking about building their own conferences. A lot of my work actually involves having to do a lot of strategic planning and convincing um, my team, as well as my you know, upper management, of why we should do conferences, why developers are important, and how to invest that money in dollars. So I got involved at Women Who Code, and this was when I first started in tech. And I wanted to be part of an organization that actually supported my interest. Um, another story that I'd love to share is I went to a very prominent browser conference. And you know, the way I look, I guess the way I sound, I had somebody who coming up to me and said, do you even belong here? And I knew that I had to find an organization that can help me feel good about myself and being able to answer that question. And I know that that does not happen to me alone. It happens to a lot of people. And we put this conference on called Connect through Women Who Code because there was an absolute solid numbers problem that we had to solve. So again, you know, we went through it. We went through the sentiment of this would be an amazing conference. And we also said, there are some real problems we need to solve. And this conference will help us solve that problem. And then three years ago, I thought, you know, developer relations is a great industry. And it'd be great if we had more leaders actually stepping up and saying, yes, we want to invest in this. Why should I have my job be so hard? Maybe I can help others convince their bosses that investing in developer relations is a good thing. So we created a little summit. Uh, and we have about 100 people. We have some amazing speakers. We record all the speakers, just like this conference. And we put them on, online so you can hear from leaders like Bear Douglas, who's been running Twitter and now Slack, Davrel, uh, Robert Nyman, Charles Morris from Microsoft, you know, very experienced veterans, talk to you about their own trials, tribulations, and success stories of working in developer relations. And uh, we'll be hosting our third year in Singapore this year to have a truly global perspective. So I'm going to try to wrap this up really quickly because I think I'm a little bit over time. Um, and so, you know, hey, let's put on a developer conference. Why is it important? Um, let's make sure that our measurements are great. Let's make sure that it's profitable, sustainable, and successful. But what if it doesn't work, right? Let's just kill it. It's easy, right? Sometimes it's not. The problem with success is a lot of people feel good after a conference, even if it wasn't the best for your company. Maybe it didn't align with your strategy. Maybe it didn't really serve the community's needs. 
everybody feels great after a conference. We all high five each other. You know, we change the narrative sometimes of how we want to talk about the success of the event. So it's hard. And then there's the legacy problem. Sometimes you're given an event and say, hey, do it or go run with it, right? I see some nodding heads. I'm like, hey, we know this. Um, and then the whole, what I call the bird in hand problem. Sometimes it's better to know what you have and you think, well, it failed this year and maybe it doesn't serve it, but I know how to fix this rather than let's get rid of it and start from scratch. But it may not be the best to keep on doing what you're doing. So just to wrap it up, I would say have a vision, figure out why you're doing it, understand your landscape. And as we said earlier in many other talks, understand your customers, understand your consumers, understand your community, right? Have a strategy that actually works and is backed up with data, but triage that data to make sure that it's actually correct. And then execute with multiple tactics. Like we have our three-pronged approach with our MDN documentation, our tech speakers, and our sponsorship. Um, it shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all problem because developers are people, and working with people and helping people and serving their needs is a complex problem that needs multiple solutions. So thank you again.